Albert Camus, French, Alb Camus, listen, the 7th of November 1913 to the 4th of January 1960, was a French philosopher, author, and journalist. His views contributed to the rise of the philosophy known as absurdism. He wrote in his essay The Rebel that his whole life was devoted to opposing the philosophy of nihilism while still delving deeply into individual freedom. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature at the age of 44 in 1957, the second youngest recipient in history. Camus did not consider himself to be an existentialist despite usually being classified as a follower of it, even in his lifetime. In a 1945 interview, Camus rejected any ideological associations. No, I am not an existentialist. Sartre and I are always surprised to see our names linked. Camus was born in French Algeria to a Pied Noir family and studied at the University of Algiers, from which he graduated in 1936. In 1949, Camus founded the Group for International Liaisons to denounce two ideologies found in both the USSR and the USA. Topic: <laughs> Life. Topic: <laughs> Early years. Albert Camus was born on 7 November 1913 in Mondovi Dréon, in French Algeria. His mother was Menorcan descent and could only hear out of her left ear. His father, Lucien, a poor agricultural worker of Alsatian descent, was wounded in the Battle of the Marne in 1914 during World War I, while serving as a member of a Zouave infantry regiment. Lucien died from his wounds in a makeshift army hospital on of October. Camus and his mother, an illiterate house cleaner, lived without many basic material possessions during his childhood in the Belcourt section of Algiers. In 1923, Camus gained acceptance into the Lycée Bugo and eventually was admitted to the University of Algiers. After contracting tuberculosis in 1930, he had to end his football activities. He had been a goalkeeper for a prominent Algerian university team. In addition, he was only able to study part time. To earn money, he took odd jobs, as a private tutor, car parts clerk, and assistant at the Meteorological Institute. He completed his License de Philosophy in 1936. In May 1936, he successfully presented his thesis on Plotinus. Rapports de l'Hellenisme et du Christianisme à travers les herbes de Plotin et de Saint Augustin. Relationship of Greek and Christian thought in Plotinus and Saint Augustine. For his Diplôme d'études supérieures, roughly equivalent to an MA thesis, Camus joined the French Communist Party in early 1935, seeing it as a way to fight inequalities between Europeans and natives in Algeria. He did not suggest he was a Marxist or that he had read Das Kapital, but did write: "We might see communism as a springboard and asceticism that prepares the ground for more spiritual activities." In 1936, the independence-minded Algerian Communist Party PCA was founded. Camus joined the activities of the Algerian People's Party La Parti du Pupil Algerien, which got him into trouble with his Communist Party comrades, who in 1937 denounced him as a Trotskyite and expelled him from the party. Camus then became associated with the French anarchist movement. The anarchist André Prudhomme first introduced him at a meeting in 1948 of the Cercle des étudiants anarchistes anarchist student circle as a sympathizer familiar with anarchist thought. Camus wrote for anarchist publications such as Le Libertaire, La Révolution Proletarienne, and Solidaridad Abrera Workers' Solidarity, the organ of the anarcho-syndicalist CNT National Confederation of Labor. Camus stood with the anarchists when they expressed support for the uprising of 1953 in East Germany. He again allied with the anarchists in 1956, first in support of the workers' uprising in Poznan, Poland, and then later in the year with the Hungarian Revolution. Camus was irreligious. I do not believe in God and I am not an atheist. Tilde Notebooks 1951-1959. He told Le Monde in 1956. I would agree with Benjamin Constant, who thought a lack of religion was vulgar and even hackneyed. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Marriage. In 1934, Camus married Simone Hayé, but the marriage ended as a consequence of infidelities on both sides. In 1935, he founded Théâtre du Travail, Workers' Theatre, renamed Théâtre de l'Équipe, Theatre of the Team, in 1937. 
It lasted until 1939. From 1937 to 1939 he wrote for a socialist paper, Alger Republican. His work included a report on the poor conditions for peasants in Kabylie, which apparently cost him his job. From 1939 to 1940, he briefly wrote for a similar paper, Soir Republicain. He was rejected by the French army because of his tuberculosis. In 1940, Camus married Francine Faure, a pianist and mathematician. Although he loved her, he had argued passionately against the institution of marriage, dismissing it as unnatural. Even after Francine gave birth to twins, Catherine and Jean, on 5 September 1945, he continued to joke to friends that he was not cut out for marriage. Camus had numerous affairs, particularly an irregular and eventually public affair with the Spanish-born actress Maria Casares, with whom he had an extensive correspondence. In the same year, Camus began to work for Paris Soir magazine. In the first stage of World War II, during the so-called Phony War, Camus was a pacifist. While in Lyon during the Wehrmacht occupation, on 15 December 1941, Camus read about the Paris execution of Gabriel Para, it crystallized his revolt against the Germans. He moved to Bordeaux with the rest of the staff of Paris Soir. In the same year he finished The Stranger, his first novel, and The Myth of Sisyphus. He returned briefly to Iran, Algeria, in 1942. Topic. Football. Camus was once asked by his friend Charles Ponset which he preferred, football or the theatre. Camus is said to have replied, Football, without hesitation. Camus played as goalkeeper for Racing Universitaire d'Algur. Rua won both the North African Champions Cup and the North African Cup twice each in the 1930s junior team from 1928 to 1930. The sense of team spirit, fraternity, and common purpose appealed to Camus enormously. In match reports Camus would often attract positive comment for playing with passion and courage. Any football ambitions disappeared when he contracted tuberculosis at the age of 17. The affliction, which was then incurable, caused Camus to be bedridden for long and painful periods. When Camus was asked in the 1950s by an alumnus sports magazine for a few words regarding his time with the Rua, his response included the following. After many years during which I saw many things, what I know most surely about morality and the duty of man I owe to sport and learned it in the Rua. Camus was referring to a sort of simplistic morality he wrote about in his early essays, the principle of sticking up for your friends, of valuing bravery and fair play. Camus' belief was that political and religious authorities try to confuse us with over-complicated moral systems to make things appear more complex than they really are, potentially to serve their own needs. A professional footballer appears as a character in the plague and football is discussed in the dialogue. Topic. Revolutionary Union movement in Europe As he wrote in L'Homme Revolte, The Rebel, in the chapter about the thought on midday. Camus was a follower of the ancient Greek solar tradition, La Pensée Solaire. In 1947-48, he founded the Revolutionary Union Movement, Groups de Liaison Internationale (GLI), a trade union movement in the context of revolutionary syndicalism, Syndicalisme Revolutionnaire. According to Olivier Todd, in his biography Albert Camus, Une Vie, it was a group opposed to some tendencies of the surrealist movement of André Breton. For more, see the book Alfred Rosmer et le Mouvement Révolutionnaire International by Christian Grau. His colleagues were Nicolas Lazarevich, Louis Mercier, Roger Lepere, Paul Chauvet, Auguste Largentier, Jean Debeau see the article, Nicolas Lazarevich, itinéraire d'une syndicaliste révolutionnaire, by Sylvain Boulouk in the review Communisme, N. Degree 61, 2000. His main aim was to express the positive side of surrealism and existentialism, rejecting the negativity and the nihilism of André Breton. From 1943, Albert Camus had correspondence with Altiero Spinelli who founded the European Federalist Movement in Milan. See Ventatine Manifesto and the book, Unirle Europa, Superare Gli Stati. Altiero Spinelli nel Partito d'Azione del Nord Italia e in Francia dal 1944 al 1945 annexed a letter by Altiero Spinelli to Albert Camus. In 1944, Camus founded the French Committee for the European Federation, Comité Français pour la Fédération Européenne, CFFE, declaring that Europe 
can only evolve along the path of economic progress, democracy and peace if the nation-states become a federation." From 22 to 25 March 1945, the first conference of the European Federalist Movement was organized in Paris with the participation of Albert Camus, George Orwell, Emmanuel Monnier, Louis Mumford, André Philippe, Daniel Mayer, François Bondy and Altiero Spinelli. This specific branch of the European Federalist Movement disintegrated in 1957 after Winston Churchill's ideas about European integration rose to dominance. Topic. Death Camus died on 4 January 1960 at the age of 46, in a car accident near Sens, in Le Grand Fossard in the small town of Villeblevin. In his coat pocket was an unused train ticket. He had planned to travel by train with his wife and children, but at the last minute he accepted his publisher's proposal to travel with him. The driver of the Fassel Vega HK500 car, Michel Gallimard, who was Camus publisher and close friend, died five days after the accident. In August 2011, the Milan newspaper Corriere della Sera reported a theory that the writer had been the victim of a Soviet plot, but Camus biographer, Olivier Todd, did not consider it credible. Camus was buried in the Lormoran Cemetery, Lormoran, Vaucluse, France. He was the second youngest recipient, at the age of 44, of the Nobel Prize in Literature, after Rudyard Kipling. At the age of 42, he was survived by his wife and twin son and daughter, Jean and Catherine, who hold the copyrights to his work. Two of Camus' works were published posthumously. The first, entitled A Happy Death, 1970, featured a character named Patrice Mersault, comparable to The Stranger's Mersault. There is scholarly debate as to the relationship between the two books. The second was an unfinished novel, The First Man 1995, which Camus was writing before he died. The novel was an autobiographical work about his childhood in Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> Literary career The first publication of Camus co-written by Jean-Paul Sickard, Yves Bourgeois and Alfred Poignant, and edited by Edmund Charlotte was Revolt dans les Asturies in May 1936. This concerned a revolt by Spanish miners brutally suppressed by the Spanish government. In May 1937 he wrote his first book L'Anvers et Londroit, dedicated to Jean Grenier and edited by Charlotte. During the war Camus joined the French resistance Cell Combat, which published an underground newspaper of the same name. This group worked against the Nazis, and in it Camus assumed the nom de guerre Beauchard. Camus became the paper's editor in 1943. He first met Sartre at the dress rehearsal of Sartre's play, The Flies, in June 1943, when the Allies liberated Paris in August 1944, Camus witnessed and reported the last of the fighting. Soon after the event on 6 August 1945, he was one of the few French editors to publicly express opposition and disgust to the United States dropping the atomic bombs on Japan. He resigned from combat in 1947 when it became a commercial paper. After the war, Camus began frequenting the Café de Flore on the Boulevard Saint-Germain in Paris with Sartre and others. He also toured the United States to lecture about French thought. Although he leaned left, politically, his strong criticisms of communist doctrine did not win him any friends in the communist parties and eventually alienated Sartre. In 1949, his tuberculosis returned, whereupon he lived in seclusion for two years. In 1951, he published The Rebel, a philosophical analysis of rebellion and revolution which expressed his rejection of communism. Upsetting many of his colleagues and contemporaries in France, the book brought about the final split with Sartre. The dour reception depressed Camus, he began to translate plays. Camus' first significant contribution to philosophy was his idea of the absurd. He saw it as the result of our desire for clarity and meaning within a world and condition that offers neither, which he expressed in the myth of Sisyphus and incorporated into many of his other works, such as The Stranger and the Plague. Despite his split from his study partner, Sartre, Camus was still categorized as an existentialist. He specifically rejected that label in his essay, Enigma, and elsewhere. The current confusion arises, in part, because many recent applications of existentialism have much in common with many of Camus' practical ideas see, resistance, rebellion, and death. But, his personal understanding of the world e.g., a benign indifference, 
in The Stranger, and every vision he had for its progress e.g., vanquishing the adolescent furies of history and society, in The Rebel undoubtedly set him apart. In the 1950s, Camus devoted his efforts to human rights. In 1952, he resigned from his work for UNESCO when the UN accepted Spain as a member under the leadership of General Franco. In 1953, he criticized Soviet methods to crush a workers' strike in East Berlin. In 1956, he protested against similar methods in Poland protests in Poznan and the Soviet repression of the Hungarian Revolution in October. Camus maintained his pacifism and resisted capital punishment anywhere in the world. He wrote an essay against capital punishment in collaboration with Arthur Kosler, the writer, intellectual and founder of the League Against Capital Punishment. He was consistent in his call for non-aggression in Algeria see below, from 1955 to 1956, Camus wrote for L'Express. In 1957, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for his important literary production, which with clear-sighted earnestness illuminates the problems of the human conscience in our times. Camus remained active and ambitious until the end of his life. Financed by the money he received with his Nobel Prize, he adapted and directed for the stage Dostoyevsky's Demons. The play opened in January 1959 at the Antoine Theatre in Paris. It was a critical success as well as an artistic and technical tour de force, 33 actors, 4 hours long, 7 sets, 24 scenes. The walls could move sideways to reduce the size of each depicted location and the whole stage rotated to allow for immediate set transformations. Camus put the painter and set decorator Mayo, who had already illustrated several of Camus' novels The Stranger, 1948 edition, in charge of the demanding task of designing these multiple and complex theater sets. Topic. Algeria Camus once confided that the troubles in Algeria "...affected him as others feel pain in their lungs." In the 1930s, Camus was affiliated with left-wing groups like the Maison de Culture in Algiers which were highly critical of the French colonial regime's treatment of Algeria's Arab and indigenous inhabitants, supporting the Bloom Violet proposal to grant Algerians full French citizenship. His 1938 address on the new Mediterranean culture represents Camus' most systematic statement on his views at this time. In 1939, Camus wrote a stinging series of articles for Alger Republicaine on the atrocious living conditions of the inhabitants of the Kabylie Highlands, advocating for economic, educational and political reforms as a matter of emergency. In 1945, following the Satif and Gelma massacre after Arab revolts against French mistreatment, Camus was one of only a few mainland journalists to visit the colony, again writing a series of article reports on conditions, and advocating for French concessions and reforms to the demands of the Algerian people. When the Algerian War began in 1954, Camus was confronted with a moral dilemma. He identified with the Pieds Noirs such as his own parents and defended the French government's actions against the revolt. He argued that the Algerian uprising was an integral part of the new Arab imperialism led by Egypt and an anti-Western offensive orchestrated by Russia to encircle Europe and isolate the United States. Although favoring greater Algerian autonomy or even federation, though not full-scale independence, he believed that the Pieds Noirs and Arabs could coexist. During the war he advocated a civil truce that would spare the civilians, which was rejected by both sides, who regarded it as foolish. Behind the scenes, he began to work for imprisoned Algerians who faced the death penalty. When he spoke to students at the University of Stockholm, he defended his apparent inactivity in the Algerian question. He stated that he was worried about what might happen to his mother, who still lived in Algeria. This led to further ostracism by French left wing intellectuals. At the time of his death, Camus was working on an incomplete novel with a strong biographical component titled The First Man. The publication of this book in 1994 has sparked a widespread reconsideration of Camus' allegedly unrepentant colonialism in the work of figures such as David Carroll in the English speaking world. Topic. Philosophy Topic. Existentialism As one of the forefathers of existentialism, Camus focused most of his philosophy around existential questions. The absurdity of life and its inevitable ending death is highlighted in the very famous opening of the novel The Stranger 1942. 
today mother died. Or maybe yesterday, I can't be sure." This alludes to his claim that life is engrossed by the absurd. He believed that the absurd, life being void of meaning, or man's inability to know that meaning if it were to exist, was something that man should embrace. He argued that this crisis of self could cause a man to commit philosophical suicide, choosing to believe in external sources that give life false meaning. He argued that religion was the main culprit. If a man chose to believe in religion, that the meaning of life was to ascend to heaven, or some similar afterlife, that he committed philosophical suicide by trying to escape the absurd. Topic. Absurdism Many writers have addressed the absurd, each with his or her own interpretation of what the absurd is and what comprises its importance. For example, Sartre recognizes the absurdity of individual experience, while Kierkegaard explains that the absurdity of certain religious truths prevents us from reaching God rationally. Camus regretted the continued reference to himself as a philosopher of the absurd. He showed less interest in the absurd shortly after publishing Le Mythe de Sisyphe, the myth of Sisyphus. To distinguish his ideas, scholars sometimes refer to the paradox of the absurd, when referring to Camus absurd. His early thoughts appeared in his first collection of essays, L'Anvers et Londroit, Betwixt and Between, in 1937. Absurd themes were expressed with more sophistication in his second collection of essays, Gnosis, Nuptials, in 1938. In these essays Camus reflects on the experience of the absurd. In 1942 he published the story of a man living an absurd life as Latranger, the Stranger. In the same year he released La Mythe de Sisyphe, the Myth of Sisyphus, a literary essay on the absurd. He also wrote a play about Caligula, a Roman emperor, pursuing an absurd logic. The play was not performed until 1945. The turning point in Camus' attitude to the absurd occurs in a collection of four letters to an anonymous German friend, written between July 1943 and July 1944. The first was published in the Revue Libre in 1943, the second in the Cahiers de Libération in 1944, and the third in the newspaper Libertés, in 1945. The four letters were published as Lettre à un ami allemand letters to a German friend in 1945, and were included in the collection Resistance, Rebellion, and Death. Topic. Ideas on the absurd Camus presents the reader with dualisms such as happiness and sadness, dark and light, life and death, etc. He emphasizes the fact that happiness is fleeting and that the human condition is one of mortality. For Camus, this is cause for a greater appreciation for life and happiness. In La Mythe, dualism becomes a paradox. We value our own lives in spite of our mortality and in spite of the universe's silence. While we can live with a dualism, I can accept periods of unhappiness, because I know I will also experience happiness to come, we cannot live with the paradox. I think my life is of great importance, but I also think it is meaningless. In La Mythe, Camus investigates our experience of the absurd and asks how we live with it. Our life must have meaning for us to value it. If we accept that life has no meaning and therefore no value, should we kill ourselves? In La Mythe, Camus suggests that creation of meaning would entail a logical leap or a kind of philosophical suicide in order to find psychological comfort. But Camus wants to know if he can live with what logic and lucidity have uncovered, if one can build a foundation on what one knows and nothing more. Creation of meaning is not a viable alternative but a logical leap and an evasion of the problem. He gives examples of how others would seem to make this kind of leap. The alternative option, namely suicide, would entail another kind of leap, where one attempts to kill absurdity by destroying one of its terms, the human being. Camus points out, however, that there is no more meaning in death than there is in life, and that it simply evades the problem yet again. Camus concludes that we must instead entertain both death and the absurd, while never agreeing to their terms. Mursault, the absurdist hero of La Tranger, has killed a man and is scheduled to be executed. Caligula ends up admitting his absurd logic was wrong and is killed by an assassination he has deliberately brought about. However, while Camus possibly suggests that Caligula's absurd reasoning is wrong, the play's anti-hero does get the last word, as the author similarly exalts Mursault's final moments. Camus made a significant contribution to a viewpoint of the absurd, and always rejected nihilism as a valid response. If nothing had any meaning, you would be right. But there is something that still has a meaning. 
Second Letter to a German Friend, December 1943. Camus' understanding of the absurd promotes public debate, his various offerings entice us to think about the absurd and offer our own contribution. Concepts such as cooperation, joint effort and solidarity are of key importance to Camus, though they are most likely sources of relative versus absolute meaning. In The Rebel, Camus identifies rebellion or rather, the values indicated by rebellion as a basis for human solidarity. When he rebels, a man identifies himself with other men and so surpasses himself, and from this point of view human solidarity is metaphysical. But for the moment we are only talking of the kind of solidarity that is born in chains. Topic. The myth of Sisyphus Despite his opposition to the label, Camus addressed one of the fundamental questions of existentialism, the problem of suicide. He wrote. There is only one really serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Deciding whether or not life is worth living is to answer the fundamental question in philosophy. All other questions follow from that." Camus viewed the question of suicide as arising naturally as a solution to the absurdity of life. In The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus seeks to identify the kinds of life that could be worth living despite their inherent meaninglessness. Topic. Views on totalitarianism Throughout his life, Camus spoke out against and actively opposed totalitarianism in its many forms. Early on, Camus was active within the French resistance to the German occupation of France during World War II, even directing the famous resistance journal Combat. On the French collaboration with Nazi occupiers he wrote, now the only moral value is courage, which is useful here for judging the puppets and chatterboxes who pretend to speak in the name of the people." After liberation, Camus remarked, "...this country does not need a Talleyrand, but a Saint Just." The reality of the bloody post-war tribunals soon changed his mind. Camus publicly reversed himself and became a lifelong opponent of capital punishment. Camus' well-known falling out with Sartre is linked to his opposition to authoritarian communism. Camus detected a reflexive totalitarianism in the mass politics espoused by Sartre in the name of Marxism. This was apparent in his work L'Homme Revolté the Rebel, which not only was an assault on the Soviet police state, but also questioned the very nature of mass revolutionary politics and ideas. Camus continued to speak out against the atrocities of the Soviet Union, a sentiment captured in his 1957 speech The Blood of the Hungarians, commemorating the anniversary of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, an uprising crushed in a bloody assault by the Red Army. Philhellenism, <laughs> debts to Greek classical thought One further important, often neglected component of Camus' philosophical and literary persona was his love of classical Greek thought and literature, or Philhellenism. This love looks back to his youthful encounters with Friedrich Nietzsche, his teacher Jean Grenier, and his own sense of a Mediterranean identity, based in a common experience of sunshine, beaches, and living in proximity to the Near Eastern world. Camus' diplomes thesis roughly like an MA thesis in most Anglophone countries was on the transition between classical Greek and Roman, and Christian culture, featuring chapters on the early church, Gnosticism, Plotinus and St. Augustine's second revelation, bringing Greek philosophical conceptuality to Christian revelation. Camus' early essay collection Gnosis Nuptials features essays set amidst classical Roman ruins, as the myth of Sisyphus and the rebel which takes as its hero Prometheus both are rooted in Camus' classical paideia. The culmination of the latter work defends a midday thought, based in classical moderation or measure, in opposition to the tendency of modern political ideologies to exclusively valorize race or class, and to dream of a total redemptive revolution. Camus' conception of classical moderation also has deep roots in his lifelong love of Greek tragic theatre, about which he gave an intriguing address in Athens in 1956. He appealed to Queen Elizabeth II for mercy for the young Greek anti-colonial freedom fighter Michalis Karaoulis, from Kypros Chypri, Zypern, who was sentenced to death in 1956. Camus' letter was acquired at auction by Nassos Katorides and donated to the National Struggle Museum in Nicosia. Topic. Works Topic. Novels 
The Stranger, Le Stranger, often translated as The Outsider, 1942. The Plague, La Peste, 1947. The Fall, La Chute, 1956. A Happy Death, La Mort Heureuse, written 1936 to 38, published posthumously 1971. The First Man, Le Premier Homme, um, incomplete, published posthumously 1995. Topic: Short stories. Exile and the Kingdom Lexel et le Royaume collection, 1957, containing the following short stories. The Adulterous Woman, La Femme Adulter. The Renegade or a Confused Spirit, La Renegade ou un Esprit Confus. The Silent Men, Les Muets. The Guest, Lot. Jonas or the Artist at Work, Jonas ou l'Artiste au Travail. The Growing Stone. La Pierre qui pousse. Topic: Nonfiction books. Christian Metaphysics and Neoplatonism, 1935. Betwixt and Between, Lanvers et Landroit, also translated as The Wrong Side and the Right Side, Collection, 1937. Nuptials, Gnosis, 1938. The Myth of Sisyphus, La de Sisyphe, 1942. The Rebel, Lum Revolte, 1951. Notebooks, 1935 to 1942. Carnets, May 1935. Février 1942, 1962. Notebooks, 1943 to 1951, 1965. Notebooks, 1951 to 1959, 2008. Published as Carnets, Tome 3, Mars, 1951, December 1959, 1989. Algerian Chronicles 2013. Albert Camus, Maria Casares. Correspondence Inédite 1944-1959 Avant Propos de Catherine Camus 2017. Topic. Plays Caligula, performed 1945, written 1938. The Misunderstanding, Le Malentendu 1944. The State of Siege, de Siege, 1948. The Just Assassins, Less Justs, 1949. Requiem for a Nun, Requiem pour un Nun, adapted from William Faulkner's novel by the same name, 1956. The Possessed, Les Possédés, adapted from Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel Demons, 1959. Topic. Essays. The Crisis of Man, lecture at Columbia University, the 28th of March 1946. Neither victims nor executioners, series of essays in combat, 1946. Why Spain, essay for the theatrical play L. A. Ta de Siege, 1948. The Ancient Greek Tragedy, Parnassus lecture in Greece, 1956. Reflections on the Guillotine, Reflections sur la Guillotine, extended essay, 1957. Create Dangerously Essay on Realism and Artistic Creation, Lecture at the University of Uppsala in Sweden 1957. Topic. Collected Essays Resistance, Rebellion, and Death 1961, A collection of essays selected by the author, including the 1945 Lettre à un ami allemand Letters to a German friend and A Defense of Intelligence, a 1945 speech given at a meeting organized by Amitié Française Lyrical and Critical Essays 1970, Youthful Writings 1976, Between Hell and Reason, Essays from the Resistance Newspaper Combat. 1944 to 1947 1991 Camuet Combat Writing 1944 to 1947 2005 Albert Camus contre la peine de mort 2011 Topic References Topic Further reading Topic Selected biographies 
Philip Malcolm Waller Thody, Albert Camus, A Study of His Work 1957, OCLC 342101 Germain Bray, Camus 1959, ISBN 1-122-01570-4 Jean-Claude Brisville, Camus 1959, ISBN 9782070210367 Emmett Parker, Albert Camus, The Artist in the Arena 1965, OCLC 342770 Adele King, Camus 1966, ISBN 0-05-001423-4 Vicente de Paolo Barreto, Camus, Vida e Obra 1970. Herbert R. Lotman, Albert Camus, A Biography 1979, ISBN 3-927258-06-7 Patrick McCarthy, Camus, A Critical Study of His Life and Work 1982, ISBN 978-0241106037 David Sprinzen, Camus, A Critical Examination 1988 ISBN 0-87722-544-3 Manuel Vasquez Montalban, Willie Glassauer, Scenes from World Literature and Portraits of Greatest Authors 1988 Circulo de Lectors Adele King, Camus, La Tranger, 50 Years On 1992 ISBN 978-0333532942 André Comte Sponville, Laurent Bove, Patrick Renou, Camus, De l'Absurde à l'Amour, Lettre Inédites d'Albert Camus 1995, ISBN 9782909096414 Alain Vercondelet, Photographies, Collection Catherine et Jean Camus, Albert Camus, Verité et Legines 1998, ISBN 9782842771089 Stephen Eric Bronner, Camus, Portrait of a Moralist, 1999, ISBN 0-8166328-3-9 Howard E. Mumma, Albert Camus and the Minister 2000, ISBN 1-55725-246-7 Olivier Todd, Albert Camus, A Life 2000, ISBN 0-7867-0739-9 Neil Helms, Harold Bloom, Albert Camus, Bloom's Biocritiques 2003, ISBN 9780791073810 Pierre-Louis Ray, Camus, L'Homme Revolte 2006, ISBN 9 trillion 782 billion 70 million 318,285 Elizabeth Hawes, Camus, A Romance 2009, ISBN 9 trillion 780 billion 802 million 118,899 Catherine Camus, Albert Camus, Solitaire et Solidaire 2009, ISBN 9 trillion 782 billion 749 million 910,800 71, Robert Zaretsky, Albert Camus, Elements of a Life 2010, ISBN 9780801479076 Virgil Tenace, Camus 2010, ISBN 9782070344321 Catherine Camus, Avec la collaboration d'Alexandre Labagovic et de Beatrice Valent, Le Monde en Partage, Itineraires d'Albert Camus Camus, 2013, ISBN 9782070140947 Sean B. Carroll, 2014. Brave Genius, A Scientist, A Philosopher, and Their Daring Adventures from the French Resistance to the Nobel Prize. Broadway Books. ISBN 978-0307952349. Heiner Whitman, Albert Camus, Kunst und Moral ISBN 3-631-39525-6 Robert Zaretsky, A Life Worth Living, Albert Camus and the Quest for Meaning ISBN 9780674724242 Topic External links Fonds Albert Camus, Cité du Livre d'Ex en Provence Wikilivres has original media or text related to this article, Albert Camus in the public domain in South Korea Albert Camus
Selective and Cumulative Bibliography Société des Etudes Camusiennes Raymond Gay Crozier Camus Collection at University of Florida Library Albert Camus at Curly Albert Camus Society UK Asociación de Estudios Camusianos and España Works by Albert Camus at Faded Page Canada Works by Albert Camus at Open Library Camus, BBC Radio 4 Discussion with Peter Dunwoody, David Walker and Christina Howells In Our Time, Jan. 3, 2008.